Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. I'm Mike, your host. This is our weekly YouTube live stream being broadcast live Thursday, May 24th, 2018 at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. This live stream will also be posted as an episode of the Counting to Five audio podcast. If you're watching live, please feel free to ask questions in the YouTube live chat at any time, and I'll try to monitor it and periodically answer questions as they come up. In these weekly live streams, we keep up to date with the latest Supreme Court news, and here's what I plan to cover today. As we approach the end of the court's term, the court continues its push to get all of its pending cases decided by the end of June. And this week, on Monday, May 21st, the court issued opinions in two cases. Uh, And one of those two was Epic Systems v. Lewis, which is a uh, major, highly anticipated case about um, employee, uh, employee arbitration agreements. Um, I'm going to discuss each of those two opinions uh, in in a few minutes, a little later in the live stream. Also on Monday, uh, May 21st, the court granted four new cases for next term. So I'm going to discuss each of those. Um, There's not really much other news this week. Uh, I mentioned last week the RBG movie, which is uh, in theaters across the country, uh, first released on May 4th. Uh, it's continued this week. It expanded to uh, 375 screens and brought in another $1.3 million, remaining in 10th place in the box office. So that's just a, a little update on uh, on the Ruth Bader Ginsburg biography uh, uh, documentary. Um, but uh, let's move on and uh, dive right into the cases. We'll start with the cert grants, the, the four new cases granted for next term. Now, these cases will likely be argued uh, somewhere around November uh, after the, when the uh, the new term starts in October. Uh, we won't know for a little while until the, uh, the court's uh, fall calendars start to come out, but uh, November, maybe earlier, maybe later. Um, the court needs, uh, just just based on the, the timing of the briefing schedule, the court um, basically needs to, to fill up its fall calendar, that's the October, November, and December oral argument uh, sessions, before the court leaves for uh, for its summer recess at the end of June. Now, so far, the court has granted 18 cases, including those four that were granted this week, 18 cases uh, for the fall. Um, if the court had a, a, a full fall argument calendar, uh, it could it could hold about 34 cases that would fill its fall calendar. Uh, in recent years, it's been lighter than that, hasn't had uh, full uh, argument days for, for all of its fall um, fall sessions. So uh, we'll just keep watching and see. But again, they have 18 cases so far. Um, we'll see how many more they add before they uh, are done at the end of June. Now, uh, an interesting thing to note about these four grants, before I get into the specific cases and talk about um, what they are, I want to uh, just talk briefly about um, about realists. A few weeks ago, if you watched the live stream, I think it was two weeks ago, I talked about realists. That's when, after the court holds one of its private conferences where the justices consider cert petitions, uh, a particular cert petition is um, is set for reconsideration at a later conference. That's known as a relist. Um, and there's a number of reasons the court might relist a case. I mean, you know, maybe a justice is on the fence about voting to grant a particular case and wants more time to consider it. Maybe a justice who voted to grant it a case wants more time to try and convince a colleague to change his or her vote. Or maybe a justice wants to write a short statement, possibly explaining the denial of a petition and encouraging parties to to bring other similar cases. Or maybe a justice is writing a dissent from the denial of a petition, possibly with the hope that the dissent would spur one of his or her colleagues to change their vote uh, and grant the case. Um, but there's there's another type of realist uh, that, that's become that's been uh, become common in recent years. Um, the vast majority or a large majority of petitions that the court ultimately decides to hear, uh, this this the percentage varies from year to year, but somewhere around seventy five percent of cases that the court decides to grant are cases that were relisted at least once before they were granted. Uh, this is this is a, a relatively new practice that seems to have started uh, around 2012. And, and this is something that, that uh, an attorney named John Elwood kind of pioneered watching the realists and tracking these realists over time. But the consensus explanation is that the court is taking time to do some extra due diligence before actually granting a case. Um, and most likely checking uh, for, for what's 
often referred to as vehicle vehicle problems with a case. Now, uh, vehicle problems, what that means is when the court grants a case, because the court uh, almost, for the most part, there's a few narrow exceptions, but for the most part, the court picks and chooses the cases it wants to hear. It has discretion to take or not take um, any of the cases uh, that come up to it um, on these petitions for certiorari. Um, and the court chooses cases because it wants to address, a, usually because it wants to address a particular legal issue. But sometimes there are cases that initially look good. They look like they're presenting a particular issue that the court wants to resolve, but they turn out to be what's called bad vehicles for answering a particular legal question. It may be that there's some legal doctrine that actually stands in the way of the court answering the interesting question. Maybe it turns out that there's no jurisdiction to hear the case. Maybe one of the parties in the case doesn't have standing to bring the particular claim that the court wants to answer. Or maybe the facts of the particular case are so unusual or idiosyncratic that they'll make it difficult for the court to rule in a way that gives good guidance to lower courts. Or maybe the procedural and factual history of the case is just so convoluted and complicated that the court will waste too much time and effort getting to the core issue, and they'd rather just wait for a cleaner case to arrive. These are all kind of things that are just uh, lumped together as, as, as vehicle problems, things that might cause a court, the court to be reluctant to take a particular case. So it, it seems like the court is relisting cases to do this final kind of sanity check before actually you know, pulling the trigger and granting the case to put it on its... Uh, on its on its docket for for argument, so I just I, I thought it was interesting this week with these four new grants. Uh, just they kind of illustrate how this this plays out. So let's go back to, to last week. So on Monday, May fourteenth, that week the court granted two cases. It denied petitions in around two hundred or so cases, but there were also five cases that the court was considering for the first time that were relisted. They were not granted or denied. They were relisted for the next conference. So now this week, so this Monday, May 21st, one of those five relisted cases was denied. So that was that, that petition was rejected and the case is gone. But the other four cases, all four of the grants this week are cases that were relisted last week. So cases that the court had, had put on its conference, uh, decided to just hold over for its next private conference and has now granted those cases. I'm just pointing this out because I think it's an interesting fact about how the court operates and, and it kind of demonstrates how the realists are an early clue about cases that the court is likely to grant. But with that out of the way, I think I'll move into the actual cases. So again, four new cases this week. Um, the first of those is a case called Virginia Uranium v. Warren. And this is a case, it's about the balance uh, between state and federal regulatory authority over uh, certain um, radioactive materials, the mining of uranium. So here's here's the basic fact. So uranium is a crucial ingredient both for nuclear power plants but also nuclear weapons. And Virginia Uranium uh, is a company that owns the largest deposit of uranium in the United States. It's located in Virginia. It's it's uh, apparently it's about 119 million pounds of uranium ore, which makes it uh, not only the largest deposit in the U.S. but one of the largest deposits in the world. And it has not yet been. Um, been uh, been been mined, but apparently due to uh, increases in uh, the prices for uranium, uh, the company wants to uh, to uh, begin mining in this uh, this deposit. Now, uh, uranium mining uh, the 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 process of extracting uranium <clears throat> um, apparently uh, has has three. Uh, is divided into kind of three components. There's the mining, that's the actual extraction of the ore from the ground. Uh, then there's milling, which is the process of, of crushing this uh, uranium ore uh, down into a sand, which can then uh, be be separated uh, so that the, uh, the the uranium is is separated out from the the waste product, the other rock uh, waste product. Um, and then there's the management of what's called the tailings, and the tailings are the non-uranium waste product. Uh, that's uh, the the side the side product the waste product of the the milling process. Now these tailings are radioactive and they must be permanently uh, stored in a secure facility after they're separated out from the the usable uh, uranium. So th that that's um, that's that's the basic process. Now here's here's the regulatory side of it. There's a federal statute known as the Atomic Energy Act, or AEA, which was enacted in 1946 to regulate the processing and use of uranium 
um, and, and it was intended to protect health and safety. Uh, and as part of that act, the AEA, it established the Nuclear, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does a number of things, but includes issuing licenses for uranium milling and tailing, uh, tailings management. And it has detailed regulatory requirements for these things. Uh, however, it doesn't regulate the first step in the process, the mining process, the actual extraction of uranium ore from the ground. Apparently, this was deemed not particularly hazardous, uh, didn't raise particular concerns, so that was left to state authorities uh, to regulate. Now, um, the 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 law, however, it leaves the states with the authority to regulate. However, um, the, the, the language in the law is they can regulate uh, only, quote, for purposes other than protection against radiation hazards. So the idea is that the, the federal statute is supposed to be taking into account um, the uh, health and safety concerns related to radiation hazards, and the states are left to regulate uh, the mining process uh, other than that. Now, the issue in this case is, is, uh, is something called preemption. Now, preemption it comes from the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, and that's a clause of the Constitution that basically says that federal law is supreme over over um, state law. And it reads, I'll just I'll just read the language from the Constitution. It says, "This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof." And all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So it basically, uh, the basic idea is wherever the federal government has the authority to regulate, the federal law is supreme over state law. And there are different uh uh, types of, of so this is referred to preemption when a federal law um, kind of overrules a state law in some area that that's uh, it's said to be preempted the federal law preempts the state law and there's different types of preemption there's conflict preemption is, is the idea of when there's a direct clash between a state law and a federal law and the federal law has to prevail there's also something known as field preemption and that's where the 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 expression is congress has occupied the field in a particular area so they've set up detailed regulatory requirements and it's clear that they they they're trying to um establish the 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 complete and total regulatory framework for something and and don't want uh state laws to interfere with that and in some cases, preemption is expressed. There's a, the, in the federal statute, it'll, it'll specifically say that state laws are in some, some area are preempted, but often it's implied. Uh, it, the, 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 the federal law does not specifically say it's preempting state law, but uh, courts have to determine based on either a conflict or this occupying of a field. And also sometimes a federal law will have what's known as a savings clause, something that specifically carves out an area where uh, state courts are still allowed to regulate. Now, this brings us to the specific facts in this case. There's a Virginia law um, that dates back to 1982 that flatly bans uranium mining. Now, it's directed at mining, um, it, which is the, the portion of the, the process that is left open to state regulation. However, uh, it's allegedly was motivated um, completely by concerns over um, over the health and safety uh, associated with the milling and tailings management. Um, so the the question here is is whether this Virginia law is preempted by the Federal Atomic Energy Act. And Virginia argues that this Virginia moratorium it is only a regulation of mining. It doesn't regulate any activity that the NRC, the National, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, actually regulates. Therefore, there can't be any preemption. It's it's just in a different a different area. Um, Virginia Uranium, the company, on the other hand, uh, argues that this is basically an end run around the prohibition on regulating protection against radiation hazards. This this specific um, uh, category that the, the state is is not allowed to regulate, and Virginia is allegedly doing an end run around that by by uh, regulating the uh, prohibiting the kind of the first step in the chain because of the concerns uh, about these later steps in the process. So that's that's the basic um, uh, idea about, about behind that case. So moving on to the next one, uh, the next case that the court granted is a case called Culbertson v. Berryhill. Now this is this is a, a real niche thing. This is a, um, a very uh, specific uh, 
issue about about one particular um, regulatory scheme, it's specifically about attorney's fees for representing claimants for social security benefits. Now, when someone, when someone um, is challenging a denial of social security benefits, and often this is this is uh, disability payments, social security disability payments. Um, there's there's two stages. First, there's an administrative proceeding before uh, an administrative law judge or ALJ from the Social Security Administration. Um, but then if, uh, if a, a claimant for benefits loses there, they can appeal that in, in a, a, a district court, a federal district court. They can, they can um, uh, go to an actual court and appeal that. Now, the federal law has two separate provisions that deal with attorney's fees for these Social Security Act um, uh, challenges. And these are in a law called, it's uh, 42 USC sections 406A and 406B, where 406A deals with the uh, administrative proceeding before a ALJ, and 406B deals with a court proceeding. And the, the way that the statute is set up is 406A has some detailed provisions um, allowing fees for attorneys repre representing clients before the Social Security Administration. And it provides for two different types of fees that can be awarded. Either the uh, attorney can request that the the ALJ, the, the administrative law judge, set a reasonable fee, um, but there's no cap given for that. It's just the, up to the discretion of the ALJ to to set a reasonable fee. Uh, in general, this, is, this comes out of the uh, it's uh, basically like a contingency fee. It comes out of the um, the amount that the Social Security claimant is going to receive in uh, in past due benefits. Um, or alternately, the ALJ could approve a fee agreement um, between the lawyer and the client, um, but that's capped at twenty five percent of the total past due payments that the uh, that the claimant would would receive. So that's that's what can be um, uh, what can be awarded. Under, for the uh, the first stage, the administrative proceeding before this, the the ALJ. Now, if the uh, if the party if the the claimant has to go to court if they they lose before the ALJ and have to go to court, then there's a second provision on 406B, which uh, has a, 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 a simple pr provision that just says, and here I'll I'll just read the language. It says, whenever a court renders a judgment favorable to a claimant under this subchapter who was represented bef before the court by an attorney. The court may determine and allow as part of its judgment a reasonable fee for such representation, not in excess of 25% of the total of the past due benefits to which the claimant is entitled by reason of such judgment. So it just says when they win, the judge can award up to 25%. And generally, the, the, this is, this is a, um, there'll be a contingency fee um, arrangement between the attorney and client uh, concerning the amount of payment, and and, and uh, apparently it's it's very common um, for the this to be set at uh, uh, twenty five percent. That's the max, and that's what these are usually set for. And the court can approve that twenty five percent. Now, here's here's the question. Here, the question is that twenty five percent cap for the attorney's fees uh, it, when when uh, an attorney takes one of these cases to court and wins in court. Um, does that twenty five percent cap cover? both fees for the administrative hearing and the court hearings, or is that only for the court hearings and additional money can be awarded for the administrative hearings? Now, I'll give an example. This is based on um, one of the claimants, uh, or a, one of the parties that was represented by the attorney in this case. Um, I'm just, I've kind of rounded the numbers. I'm using round numbers just for simplicity, but here's, here's the basic idea. Um, this attorney, Mr. Culbertson, um, in this case, was representing a claimant named Katrina Woods. Uh, and in the uh, hearing before the ALJ, this is uh, the administrative hearing, the ALJ found that she was not disabled and not entitled to any benefits. Now, uh, he brought this case to, uh, to court, and the district court reversed that, um, that decision, awarded uh, $4,000 in attorney's fees under a law called the Equal Access to Justice Act. Now, the Equal Access, Access to Justice Act, it provides attorney's fees for um, when there's litigation against the government, when the government position wasn't substantially justified. That's the, the, the language, uh, the standard. And so, so the attorney was awarded $4,000 under this Equal Access to Justice Act. Um, but then the case was sent back to the ALJ to determine how much um, past due benefits uh, were actually... Uh, uh, should be awarded. Um, the attorney reached an agreement with the the client um, to uh, to receive 25% uh, of the the past due benefits 
um, less the amount of the uh, Equal Access to Justice Act, so less that $4,000 that um, he had already received uh, in attorney's fees. Now, the administrative law judge ended up awarding $34,000 in past due benefits. 25% of that is, is roughly uh, $8,500. Um, the ALJ also awarded uh, $2,500 in reasonable fees under 406A. Now that's the, the fees for the, the agency proceeding. So here's the issue. The attorney is entitled to up to 25% um, of, the, of the award uh, for the, the representation in court. Now that would be 25% would be $8,500 minus the 4,000 that the attorney already received under the Equal Access to Justice Act, which leaves $4,500 that the attorney uh, could potentially get. And the attorney sought that money. The government on the other hand says, the attorney's only entitled to $2,000 because of the $2,500 award under 406A for the agency litigation. And the government said that the 25% cap applied to both parts of the proceeding. So that's that's the, the basic conflict here. So it's just a dispute over how to calculate this money. Um, and the, the the argument basically is that the plain language of this 25% uh, this cap, it refers to the representation in court um, it refers to the 25% the, uh, of a reasonable fee for uh, such representation. And that refers back to the representation before the court by an attorney. Um, and, and, uh, and so the argument is that this 25% cap is only in the second part. Now, the interesting thing that happened here is once this case uh, petition was brought to the Supreme Court, the Social Security Administration actually in response to this petition in the Supreme Court, um, flipped positions and actually concluded that this attorney Culbertson was was absolutely right and they've now agreed that he was entitled to the full 25% the full amount of the fees that he had requested. So they've actually told the court the court may wish to consider appointing an amicus that's a friend of the court to defend the judgment of the Court of Appeals below. So the, the, the government is saying that they're not going to stick by the position they were arguing below and they agree that this attorney should win. So uh, it's just a um, interesting little little dispute here, but I mean, it seems uh, likely that it's a foregone conclusion that uh, that uh, this attorney is going to win, given that the government has now um, sided uh, with him. But it'll be interesting to see if uh, the court appoints someone to represent the other side and and make the argument that in fact the uh, Social Security Administration was right the first time. Uh, moving on, the third new case is a case called Jam v. International Finance Corp, and this is about um, immunity in court for international organizations. Now, this refers to uh, organizations that are composed of multiple member countries. Now, these are usually, they're established by a treaty, and there are just a number of examples of this, things like the World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund. And apparently there's over 80 of these uh, types of organizations that the United States is a member of. Now, some of these organizations are uh, immune under the treaty that establishes them. And that, that includes the, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund. But the rest of these organizations are governed by a federal law dates the dates from 1945 known as the International Organizations Immunities Act. So this, this act, um, it, what it says is it says that the same immunity from suit, uh, it says that these organizations are entitled to the same immunity from suit and every form of judicial process as is enjoyed by foreign governments. So here's the basic facts of this particular case. So the International Finance Corporation is, uh, is one of these international organizations. It was chartered in 1955 and it's headquartered in the District of, of Columbia. It has 184 member countries, including the United States. And it, it's, a, it's an organization whose mission is to fight poverty, and its mechanism is that it, it provides loans in the developing world for projects that would otherwise have difficulty finding funding. And one of these loans was a $450 million loan for uh, something known as the Tata Mundra Power Plant in Gujarat, India. And uh, the allegations in this case are that the organization, the, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, uh, allegedly failed to properly oversee the project as they were, uh, they were required to under their, uh, their, um, their governing uh, uh, regulations and the terms of the loan. And it, the result was a major economic and environmental harm uh, caused by the, the, the way that this, uh, this um, power plant was uh, was constructed and uh, and uh, and operated uh, major economic and environmental harm to nearby communities 
And the suit was brought by farmers, fishermen, and others uh, for a variety of tort claims and also breach of contract claims um, against this the IFC uh, due to their negligence and other uh, failings in supervising this uh, this project. Now, the IFC argues it's immune from suit. So the issue is, as I, as I mentioned, this act, this federal act, the International Organizations Immunity Act, or IOA, IOIA, uh, says that they have the same immunity from suit as is enjoyed by foreign governments. Now, the IOIA was passed in 1945, and in 1945, foreign sovereign immunity was still considered a purely a political determination. It was the president and the State Department would decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether um, whether some uh, foreign sovereign should be immune in, in uh, federal court. Um, uh, later, subsequent to that, a standard emerged that that that, uh, that was later it was it was codified eventually in something called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in 1976. But the, the there was a division between public acts, so acts that were governmental in nature, and commercial acts, where there would be immunity in court for public acts, the acts of a sovereign as a government, but no immunity when a a, a foreign government was just acting as a commercial enterprise. Um, and that's the that's the governing law today. This Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. That's the governing law for for other countries, for for sovereign nations. Now the question here is: Is the immunity provided under the IOIA is it the same as that immunity under the FSIA, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act? In other words, does the immunity that these organizations have, like the International Finance Corporation, does it have the same division between the, uh, public acts and commercial acts? Um, the petitioners, in this case, they argue that the commercial financing activities that occurred in the United States bring the uh, IFC within the commercial activities exception to, to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act and therefore not immune. Um, the argument on the other side is that the IOIA doesn't, since the, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act was a later development. It didn't exist at the time of the 1945 when these, uh, the International Organizations Immunity Act was passed. That Really, it's the type of foreign immunity that was in place in 1945 that applies. And the, the DC Circuit, the lower court, the, 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 the uh, Federal Circuit Court for the District of Columbia, it held that in 1945, immunity was effectively complete and total. The, this distinction between public and commercial activities wasn't recognized and didn't exist yet, and that's what should be applied to these international organizations. So, um, so that's that's what the court will be deciding there. There's a few uh, oddities about this case. One is that there's there's a dispute between the parties over, about whether the uh, the IFC's charter actually waives its immunity. And this seemed to be an important issue in the briefing and in the lower court opinion, but it doesn't seem to be within the issue that the petitioners actually asked the court to review. And it seems like the court probably won't touch it because it isn't isn't really um, the issue that, that the, they asked the court to, to answer. Um, there's also an argument that, that appears to be fairly strong by the IFC that, that even if there is this uh, commercial activities exception um, to their, their immunity, that the activities in this case don't just don't actually fit in that exception and don't qualify as commercial activities. Um, there's, there's it seem, seems to be a fairly strong argument that the real um, conduct that's being targeted here is the public acts in India um, under its under its um, its uh, its acts in, in financing uh, these uh, the poverty relief financing of uh, of um, operations in uh, in developing countries so uh, there's just some some oddities about that case but um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the court interprets that old statute in light of the uh, the more recent uh, foreign sovereign immunities act um, and that brings us me to the the fourth of the uh, the four new cases that were granted this is a case called Royal v Murphy now this this is a, a very interesting and kind of a um, uh, odd case. So here's, let me just read, this is the question presented. This is the question the petitioners brought to the Supreme Court asking the court to decide. And the question is this, whether the 1866 territorial boundaries of the Creek Nation within the former Indian Territory of Eastern Oklahoma constitute an Indian reservation today under 18 U.S.C. 1151A. All right, so so they're asking whether this particular um, land, the, 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 the boundaries of the Creek Nation from 1866, whether this constitutes an Indian reservation. Why does this matter? Well, in this case, the validity of a murder prosecution actually depends on the answer. Let me back up and give just a 
brief facts about this case. It, it stems from a 1999 murder. Um, a, a man named Patrick Murphy committed a particularly gruesome and sadistic murder of a man named George Jacobs in Oklahoma. Now, he was convicted in Oklahoma State Court and sentenced to death. He appealed unsuccessfully in the state courts, brought a federal habeas petition action, and ended up winning in the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals. Now, the legal argument is this. Patrick, both Patrick Murphy and the victim, the man that he murdered, were, um, were members, uh, enrolled members of the, the Creek Nation, the Creek Indian Tribe. Um, now, the argument is this. The argument is that the Creek Nation's uh, territory the reservation territory in eastern Oklahoma was never formally disestablished. Congress never took uh, formal steps to to make that no longer uh, reservation land. Now, a large section of Oklahoma, a sizable section of Oklahoma, including most of the city of Tulsa, is is allegedly technically part of this Indian reservation still. And there's a, a crime, a, a law, a federal law known as the Major Crimes Act, um, and it, it, it dates back from 1885 and, and this federal law, um, it, it makes certain, fe uh, federal law, it makes federal law, criminal law applicable to certain major crimes, including murder, kidnapping, arson, some others, when they're committed by Indians in Indian country. Um, and here's the, here's, here's some of the key language, any Indian who commits, um, any of the following offenses, namely murder, and then it lists various other crimes, shall be subject to the same law and penalties as all other persons committing any of the above offenses within the exclusive jurisdiction of the United States. So it's basically saying within these, within by a crime committed by an Indian in Indian country, um, will be treated as as uh, as uh, as if it were happening within a, a federal territory, a federal territory governed exclusively by federal law. Now, the important thing about this is it's exclusive jurisdiction. It means that the state courts don't have um, jurisdiction over these crimes and can't punish these crimes. Um, and then uh, another provision, 18 U.S.C. 1151A, that's the provision that was mentioned in that in the, the question that I, that I read earlier. Uh, it says that the term Indian country, as used in this chapter, means all land within the limits of any Indian reservation under the jurisdiction of the United States government. So that's the question. Is this land in Oklahoma that, that was once uh, the, the territory of the Creek Nation, is that actually still technically an Indian reservation? And therefore, this was a crime committed by an Indian on an Indian reservation and therefore exclusively within this federal jurisdiction. Uh, and, and under this argument, the state of Oklahoma had no jurisdiction to um, to prosecute this murder. It could only be prosecuted by federal authorities. So there's there's there, there's a, a, a deep historical dispute um, going on in this case. Before it became a state, most of what was now Eastern Oklahoma was was known at the time as the Indian ter Territory, and this area, most of it, belonged to what, what was what was referred to as the so-called Five Civilized Tribes. This is the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole tribes, and these are tribes that were forcibly relocated from the southeastern United States. Uh, this is uh, this is the 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 um, the events the known known as the infamous Trail of Tears. Where uh, where uh, Indians from these various tribes were um, marched across the country to to what is now eastern Oklahoma, and the claim here is that when the Indian Territory was incorporated into Oklahoma when it was made a U.S. state, Congress never formally formally disestablished the reservations of those five tribes, and the 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 Murphy are, uh, relies uh, on a, a 1984 Supreme Court case called Solomon v. Bartlett where the Supreme Court um, established a test for when an Indian reservation has been disestablished. And they basically say, under this test that the Supreme Court estab established in this case to, to determine when a reservation no longer exists, this, it just, uh, these, uh, um, this Creek territory uh, just doesn't meet that test. So that, that, that uh, reservation still technically exists under federal law. Now, Oklahoma, on the other hand, argues that this is actually, they, they say it's basically crystal clear from history that everyone has understood that the reservations were disestablished at the time of statehood. And they say that this is demonstrated by 
various acts of Congress before and after Oklahoma statehood. And then they point to Oklahoma's unique history as, as you know, containing this, the, the Indian territory as a reason to not rely on that, um, the, the Solem case, uh, um, uh, saying it's, it's really doesn't apply to the unique uh, situation of Oklahoma. And Murphy argues back that Oklahoma is really not that unique. There's plenty of other states that had uh, similar um, histories uh, to one degree or another that, that have been uh, um, ruled by this, uh, this solemn test. Now, the briefs in this case, they contain fascinating competing accounts of the history of the Creek Nation. They go through various treaties and congressional acts. And just, I think this is a fascinating for anyone who's interested in, in this this part of U.S. history. And this is, if there's anyone listening to this podcast that's a law student or a future law student, uh, I want to give a plug for if your law school offers it and it fits in your schedule, strongly consider taking a course in American Indian law. The history of, of uh, the law's treatment of, uh, of the Indian nations, it's fascinating. It's, it's often ugly, but it's always messy. Uh, it, it's 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 just um, we're used to thinking about the constitutional balance of power between the federal governments and the states, but the way that the sovereign Indian tribes fit into the system is a question that goes all the way back to the founding. And it's been answered in numerous different ways over the years, but never definitively, and it still creates new puzzles and 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 headaches for lawyers all, all the time. It's just it's just one of these anomalies in our system, and. It, it also it really illustrates very vividly how so much of law is historically contingent. Legal frameworks are are almost never constructed in some sort of logical process based on first principles, but instead they're they're just built up in a messy piece by piece process over time by many different parties with different objectives and different expectations, and and it sometimes occurs over huge spans of time, and it's it's just um uh it. it it's the American Indian law is kind of a very wide reaching uh, subject and, and uh, endlessly complicated and interesting. Um, another interesting thing about the briefs in this, the, this case is the briefs on the, on the two sides, they present kind of wildly different characterizations of the consequences of the lower court decision in this case. According to Oklahoma, this, this potentially casts doubt on thousands of criminal prosecutions, and it also could mean in the territory of the, these five tribes, it could mean 1.8 million Oklahomans, which is almost half the population of the state, uh, would now be deemed to reside in Indian country and could be subject to tribal regulatory authority in various ways. Um, so they, they, they paint this picture of a, just a hugely... Um, uh, uh, a, just a huge, huge impact uh, of this lower court decision. Now, Murphy, on the other hand, says that this is uh, very much overblown, that most of the criminal challenges are have are waived. They're already be out of time and, and it'd be too late for anyone to bring these these claims. And, and that basically any real problems that, that exist uh, due to this uh, characterization as it still being an Indian reservation, those are problems that could be fixed by Congress, that Congress could and would step in to fix any, any serious problems. And it, I, it's just, this is interesting because this is an example. Uh, it's a very common um, thing, but an example of the strategic framing of the consequences um, of, of a, a court's decision. And, and you see this routinely where a party that is that is defending the status quo, defending the current um, state of the law, will will cite you know what's known as a parade of horribles, all the terrible things that will happen if the court um, adopts the standard that the other other side is uh, advocating. And you know the the idea is the justices will think twice; they'll be hesitant to unleash chaos on you know, on lower courts, on uh, on you know um, uh, on the government, on people that have been relying on uh, the way the law has been, and and. Uh, and so, so this parade of horribles, all these you know huge impacts are are put out there front and center. On the other hand, the party that's seeking to change the status quo will will try and de-emphasize. They'll they'll emphasize how modest the impact will be and how this is really just a small step. But the interesting thing is, once a party wins, if a party wins uh, and the court des decides uh, that there's a change in the status quo, at that point, the incentives for the parties really flip. Uh, then the party who who had been resisting the change will now uh, have an incentive to to downplay the impact and and try and minimize it and say well this really doesn't 
doesn't uh, go that far it really won't make that much difference where the party that was before emphasizing how modest and how how little you know this step was will try and leverage that decision for all it's worth and 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 push it as far as they can so it's just just a this is i just thought it was a particularly vivid uh, illustration of that um that dynamic so those are the four cases and again those will those will be argued uh next term in the fall sometime um and with that, I'm going to move on to the two new opinions in argued cases that we, we got this week. Um, this brings us up to a total of 30 opinions for the term so far. And now there's only, there's only five weeks left, and we're still not halfway done with the opinions in argued cases. We have 30 decided cases, and there's still 32 uh, opinions to go with only five weeks left. That means the court needs to issue an average of six to seven a week. Uh, in order to clear these all by the end of June, um, they they always do. They they, they you know the, so the there's every expectation that they will hit that self-imposed um, end of June deadline. Um, but the last couple of weeks of June will probably be very heavy um, in in opinions. Now the two opinions this week, both opinions were majority opinions were written by Justice Gorsuch, um, but the lineups were very different. One was a closely divided five to four case along the stereotypical ideological lines with the, the five more conservative justices in the majority, the four more liberal justices in the dissent. The other case, um, by contrast, was seven to two, um, and the two dissenters were the two justices that would um, typically be thought to be Gorsuch's closest ideological allies, Justices Thomas and Alito. So it's just, just interesting, two Gorsuch opinions, but the lineups are, are very, very different. Um, I'm going to talk about each of them now. The first of these cases is Epic Systems Corp v. Lewis. Now, this is a highly anticipated case. This is one of the cases this term that has been um, very closely watched. Um, it's a, a, a very potentially a big impact in the labor and employment um, uh, realm. And this is the uh, the five to four um, Gorsuch majority. Um, there's a, a short concurrence by Justice Thomas and also a lengthy dissent uh, for the four liberal justices written by Justice Ginsburg. Um, but let me start out with a little background. This is actually three consolidated cases. Um, but the facts are, are very similar for, for each of them as, as is relevant to, to the Supreme Court case. Each of these three cases involves um, an employee collective action claim under the Fair Labor Standards Act for minimum wage or overtime violations. Now, collective action is a special procedure under the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA. Um, it has, collective action has some important differences from class actions, but for purposes of this case, it can be treated as the same as a class action. I'll just refer to it um, interchangeably as a class action for simplicity, um, but it's, it's an action brought not just by the named plaintiff or plaintiffs, but on behalf of other similarly situated workers. Uh, now, in each of these cases, the employees um, had signed arbitration agreements, and it's an agreement that legal claims related to the employment will go to an arbitrator, not to a court. And in addition to the arbitration agreement, each of these agreements contained a, what's referred to as a class action waiver. It was a uh, um, language that says these, that any legal claims had to be brought in arbitration and it had to be individual arbitration only, um, could not be brought on a class-wide basis. Now there's two federal statutory schemes that are involved in this case. And the, the first is known as the Federal Arbitration Act, which dates from 1925. And this is an act that was passed in response to lower court hostility to arbitration, and it required courts to enforce arbitration, agree arbitration agreements according to their terms. But it has a savings clause, it has an exception that says that, 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 um, that uh, arbitration clauses do not have to be, it can be, um, can be not enforced upon such grounds as exist at law or in equity for the rev for the revocation of any contract. Um, and the argument in this case is that a different federal statute, the National Labor Relations Act, provides um, grounds to to uh, to um, invoke this savings clause and 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 take these uh, uh, remove these arbitration agreements from uh, enforcement under the FAA. Now, the National Labor Relations Act, that's the second of these, uh, was, was, it was states from 1935. Um, it, it, uh, it protects, um, it, it is the major, major statute to protect uh, labor 
organizing, um, unionization, things like that. Um, and a particular uh, part of the, the NLRA, uh, Section 7, it protects, here's the language, it protects the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. Now, the crucial language here is that other concerted activity for uh, mutual aid or protection. Now, uh, the, the key um, uh, development here was a decision by the National Labor Relations Board, that's the federal um, body that administers the National Labor Relations Act, a decision in 2012 that class action litigation, class-wide litigation, um, is, uh, qualifies as other concerted activities protected by Section 7. And um, also, another section of, uh, of the, the, the National Labor Relations Act says that employer interference with these Section 7 rights is an illegal, unfair labor practice, and therefore class action waivers are illegal under, under Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act and therefore unenforceable. So the argument here is that um, under the National Labor Relations Act, if, uh, if a employer uh, tries to enter into a class uh, class action waiver um, with an employee. This is trying to. This is an attempt to uh, to interfere with their Section Seven rights. It's illegal. Therefore, it fits under the Savings Clause of the Federal Arbitrations Act because this is a grounds that exists. Illegality is a grounds that exists for revocation of a contract. So that's the basic argument here. Now, Justice Gorsuch writes for the majority and rejects this argument. Um, he argues first that the Savings Clause um, applies only to grounds for revocation of any contract. And he says the court has held that this applies only to generally applicable rules of contract law, not arbitration specific provisions, not specific provisions of law that are specifically targeting arbitration provisions. Uh, and, and he points that, that the, the whole purpose of arbitration is that it provides for these cheaper, simpler, faster, more streamlined procedures. And that's uh, not possible in a class-wide context due to necessary procedural formalities that are involved in class procedures, so so this this uh, this this targeting of um, of the um, the class action waivers is 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 kind of a specifically targets um, arbitration agreements and uh, and therefore doesn't fit within that uh, that what that savings clause was trying to protect, which is just generally applicable rules of contract law. Uh, Gorsuch goes on to talk about the NLRA. And the, the argument here that he relies on is that, that when there is um, when you have uh, different federal statutes here, the FAA, the Arbitration Act, and the NLRA, that statutes need to be interpreted to work together whenever possible. And the argument is that, that Section 7, which provides for these, these um, collective uh, concerted activities, protects these concerted activities, it doesn't clearly displace the FAA. It doesn't say that it's abridging or amending the FAA. It doesn't refer to arbitration in any way. Um, so other concerted activities should not be interpreted in a way that would make it conflict. He points out that other concerted activities follows immediately after the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, the right to bargain co collectively, and says in context, um, this, this, this other concerted activities is referring to workplace free, free association, not to class litigation. Um, and, uh, and also Gorsuch argues that unlike, uh, organizing or collective bargaining, the National Labor Relations Act, um, otherwise doesn't regulate or say anything else about class litigation. So it doesn't seem that that's what the NLRA was trying to protect. Um, and also doesn't use any language that specifically refers to litigation, doesn't refer to claims or other other specific litigation language. Um, and he, he quotes, he uses a, a, a well-known quote from Justice Scalia, which says that Congress does not alter the fundamental details of a regulatory scheme in vague terms or ancillary provisions. It does not, one might say, hide elephants in mouse holes, saying, Basically, that that if, if there was the, an intention to to overrule the FAA in passing this uh, um, this uh, other concerted activities provision in the NLRA, that Congress would have made that clear. Um, and Gorsuch also cites uh, what he kind of characterizes as an unbroken string of cases that reject efforts to um, create conflicts between the Arbitration Act and other federal statutes. Um, he also refers to, there's a concept known as Chevron deference. This is a, a concept of administrative law that says when there's a, a, a vague statute 
courts need to defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation. Um, however, Gorsuch says it points out that this this only applies to statutes that are administered by the agency in question. Now, the NLRB administers the National Labor Relations Act, but they say, Gorsuch says what the NLRB is seeking to do here is to narrow the scope of the FAA, the Federal um, Arbitration Act, and the NLRB does not administer that. And the, this this kind of deference, the Chevron deference, um, shouldn't be an invitation for agencies to advance their own agency ad agenda at the expense of other statutes that they aren't responsible for. Um, he also makes the argument that part of the, the justification for Chevron deference is that it defers to policy choices of the executive branch. But here there's a kind of a peculiar situation because the executive branch is actually divided in this case with the National Labor Relations Board um, taking one position in this litigation and the Solicitor General, the representative of the, pres uh, the, the federal government in the Supreme Court on behalf of the Trump administration, um, taking the opposite side and actually um, siding with the the uh, corporations in this case. So, um, so he rejects deference in that particular case. Now, Justice Thomas had a short concurrence. He joins the majority, but he goes on to kind of um, promote an it's an idiosyncratic view that he has um, he has put forth in other. Um, Federal Arbitration Act cases, and he argues that the savings clause applies only to issues of contract formation. Uh, in other words, whether a contract was validly entered into. And he says that because this uh, here, the, the argument is that the NLRA um, affects the legality of the agreement, but not whether it was validly entered into, that it doesn't fit within the terms of that savings clause. Um, so it's just, this is a, it, again, this is a position that only Justice Thomas holds. Uh, it's just an outlier position, um, but he uh, once again reiterates that. But that, that brings us to Justice Ginsburg's dissent. It's a, it's a lengthy and very strongly worded dissent. Um, she says, for example, that the majority is, quote, egregiously wrong. Um, and she she goes uh, through what, uh, what she sees as the history of the National Labor Relations Act. She says it was intended to address labor market imbalance by allowing strength in numbers. And she kind of an analogizes this um, to, to collective or class actions. Um, and, and also she, she looks at the specific language of section seven, the concerted activities for the purpose of mutual aid or protection, and just goes to the dictionary, looks at the definitions of concerted, of mutual, and shows that this, this, uh, there's, um, potentially a very large breadth, uh, to this, um, provision. Um, she also argues that the 2012 decision by the National Labor Relations Board, where it explicitly said, um, that these, uh, class action waivers violated Section 7. She says that was not really breaking new ground. It was recognizing longstanding, um, uh, longstanding position of the NLRB that that uh, that Section 7 protects collective litigation. Um, and she she also uh, again looks at the 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 other side of the of the the coin, the 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 Federal Arbitration Act. Um, looks at the the history there and notes that it was created to deal with commercial disputes between merchants. Um, and she points to what she sees as a series of Supreme Court decisions starting in the early 1980s that really expanded the reach of the Federal Arbitration Act and caused employers to respond by drastically expanding their use of arbitration provisions. Um, and, and then she says a similar thing happened with these class action waivers after they were kind of blessed by the Supreme Court. And she says, this is a quote, as I see it in relatively recent years, the court's Arbitration Act decisions have taken many wrong turns. Um, but she also argues that even under current precedents, this is going a step further, that illegality is not an arbitration specific reason for invalidation. And it's a well established and generally applicable um, defense to, to, uh, to a contract. Um, she she makes a few other arguments. She says also uses the argument of implied re repeal. The, the National Labor Relations Act was later in time than the Federal Arbitration Act. So to the extent there is a conflict between the two, um, the the later statute should be deemed to be controlling and cutting back on the scope of the earlier statute. Um, and but she also. Um, and this is a, a attack that Justice Ginsburg has taken in dissents in the past, has kind of a call to action for Congress. She says at one point early in her opinion, she says, congressional correction of the court's elevation of the FAA over workers' rights to act in concert is urgently in order. So basically calling for Congress to step in here and fix what she sees as um, uh, the court uh, going the wrong way. Um, in, in Justice Gorsuch's majority, he, he also responds um, to some of these um, arguments from the dissent. Um, 
and uh, saying in part, for example, that the dissent is is trying to relitigate decades of FAA precedents um, rather than applying them as they exist. That Justice Ginsburg is basically going back and and rehashing dissents uh, from various of these earlier cases. Um, and and not just faithfully applying the cases, this um, uh, um, chain of uh, of cases that that uh, that the court has decided over the years. And he also um, emphasizes that, that the policy questions, whether whether this is a bad result um, as a uh, as a matter of uh, federal um, you know labor relations, that's a policy question for Congress, not the court. Um, and he notes in passing that that, that Congress, uh, does, the current Congress, does not necessarily um, share Justice Ginsburg's opinion. He notes that um, there was recently a um, Congress uh, actually repealed a ban on consumer class action waivers that had been put in place by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the, C the CFPB, um, which shows that uh, that the the concern that Justice Ginsburg has about these may not be shared by members of Congress. Um, so that's the uh, that's that's the basic uh, idea of that. Um, that opinion. Now, you know, it, it's it's being viewed on on one hand uh, as a as a uh, major cutback in um, in uh, the the rights of uh, of of workers to to bring uh, class actions in the face of uh, of these these type of um, arbitration agreements and class action waivers. But on the other hand, there was a there was a, a circuit split. That is, different federal circuit courts had gone different ways on this question. And I believe it only three circuits uh, in the country that had adopted this uh, position of the uh, National Labor Relations Board. So, so uh, in in the rest of the circuits of the country, this is uh, this decision is is basically maintaining the status quo as it existed before and, and allowing the enforcement of these uh, class action waivers. Um, but uh, but uh, that's that's that basically the the uh, the general um, uh, shape of that opinion. So that brings me to the second opinion. This is the last thing I'll cover tonight. I'll go through this one pretty quickly. This is the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe v. Lund Lundgren. Um, this was a. This is the uh, Gorsuch majority for for seven members of the court. Um, and here's the basic facts: the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe, uh, located in Washington State, it gave up its traditional land um, under an 1855 treaty, but in recent years it's been gradually buying back land. Um, in the hopes of having the federal government take that land into trust, that's a mechanism for for turning that land into sovereign tribal land once again. Now, the issue in this case is a parcel of land that the, this that the tribe purchased in 2013. It's not part of its current reservation territory. It's part of its ancestral um, area territory, but not its current reservation territory. And it's southern. The southern southern neighbors of this particular parcel of land are the Lundgrens, um, the other parties in this case. Now, the issue here is there's a fence on the property near the southern property line, but not on the southern property line. It runs parallel to the southern property line, but there's a strip between the fence and the recorded property line that that is about uh, about an acre, one acre total between those two. Um, areas. Now, the Lundgrens, the the parcel to the south of the of the Indian tribes' land, they've owned this land directly since 1981, and it's been in their family since the 1940s. And they believed that they owned the land all the way up to the fence. And in fact, the prior owner of the Upper Skagit land had also treated that fence as the property line and had uh, believed that the fence was the property line rather than the the actual line recorded in in uh, deeds in the recording office. Now, the tribe wanted to remove the fence, clear cut the property to the recorded line, and then erect a new fence on that on that uh, recorded property line. The Lundgrens, Lundgrens brought a quiet title action. A quiet title action is, is an action someone can bring to resolve competing claims about a particular piece of land to just determine who has what rights over a particular piece of land. And their claim is, uh, is under a doctrine known as adverse possession. This is a property um, law doctrine known as adverse possession. And the idea of adverse possession is that if someone actually possesses, meets certain requirements of actually possessing a piece of land for a certain period of time, and there are certain requirements, for example, it has to be open and notorious occupation. It means it can't be done in secret. They have to just be using and occupying that land out in the open. And it's continuous for a certain period of time, depending on state law, it's usually 10 to 20 years. In this case, it was 10 years under Washington law. Um, they, they're deemed to have adversely possessed the land and, and it becomes the property of that possessing party. And this particular case with a, a, a misplaced fence, a fence that doesn't line up with the property line, that's kind of a classic case where adverse possession um, 
can be used where where a boundary has been mismarked and the parties have for years treated uh, treated some other line other than what's recorded in the actual deeds as the property line. Um, and, and if that goes on long enough, that can actually, you know, change the boundaries of the property um, for, for, uh, for all legal purposes. Now, in fact, I, apparently the trial court um, below in a lower court, a trial court judge called this one of the strongest cases of adverse possession that he'd ever seen. Um, and it was, uh, it doesn't seem to be disputed that the Lundgrens or, or their, their predecessors in, uh, on the land had basically held title by adverse possession for decades before the tribe ever bought their parcel above. So so, so under typical, you know, normal state contract law um, principle, or I mean, property law principles, the Lundgrens would own this land clear up to the fence. Here's the problem. The Upper Skagit tribe argued that they have sovereign immunity um, and, and can't be brought into court uh, in this quiet title action. So that's, that's what brings us... Uh, this case to the Supreme Court. Now, the majority opinion, this is opinion by Justice Gorsuch, um, argues that the, 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 the way that this case was decided below was by a distinction between what's known as in rem and in personam actions. Now, an in personam action is an action that's asserting jurisdiction over a particular person. This is the vast majority of typical lawsuits you would think of if there's a lawsuit for some tort or a contract breach of contract claim or most types of statutory claims. There's some you're, you're asserting that you have some claim against some particular person or some business or some some other entity, and it's against that person. Uh, that that you're, you're bringing the claim. An in rem action is different. This is where you have an action where you're you're, you're asking the court to assert its jurisdiction over a thing, over some thing. And the, the the classic example of this is is these type of quiet title actions or other like real property disputes, where you're asking the court to to issue its authority over this property within its jurisdiction, regardless of who the parties are who have interests in that property. And the state court decision below had said that sovereign immunity doesn't apply to these type of in rem actions. And they'd relied on a Supreme Court case from 1992 called County of Yakima, the Confederated, Confederated Tribes and Bands of Yakima Nation. Now, Justice Gorsuch in the majority says that the Yakima case, it used this in rem in personam distinction for a narrow, um, a narrow purpose of, of tax law. And it had nothing to do with sovereign immunity. So, so Gorsuch says that this this case just does not support the distinction that the low, lower court um, drew. Now, kind of somewhat oddly, the majority doesn't squarely say that this um, exception for sovereign immunity doesn't exist in rem actions. It just says that the Yakima case didn't require that result, and then moves on because by the time this case got to the Supreme Court, the Lundgrens had actually moved away from that in rem in personam argument that the lower court had relied on. And instead we're arguing something known as the immovable, pro immovable property exception to sovereign immunity. And this is an argument that um, immo immovable property, in other words, real property, land, um, buildings, things like that. There's a, there's a long standing exception to sovereign immunity um, where, where basically um, the, the court's, of the particular jurisdiction where the, the land is located, always have jurisdiction over uh, any owner of that land for, for resolving land disputes, uh, regardless of whether they're a sovereign. Um, but uh, but uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch um, doesn't address uh, that, that doesn't answer that question of whether this immovable property exception applies to the Indian tribe in this case, um, but instead remands the case back to state court to consider this theory um, in the first instance, saying that basically this argument didn't come up until the briefing in the Supreme Court. It wasn't relied on below. So the court wants the lower courts to take the first crack at deciding whether this applies. So is the case really the, it doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot. Now, there's an interesting concurrence by Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, um, joined by Justice Kennedy. And he basically asks, what are the Lundgrens supposed to do in this situation? Now, you know, the, the issue here is that sovereign immunity is about whether you have access to the courts, whether you can, you can bring someone into court. It's not about the underlying rights. And there doesn't seem to be much of a dispute here that the Lundgrens actually, under state um, property law, have a right to that land up to the fence. And so just, uh, Chief Justice Roberts is asking, well, so what are they supposed to do in this situation? And, and pointing out that they don't really have many... Um, good options. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem right that the tribe just always wins no matter what. And he says, Justice uh, Roberts says, otherwise a tribe could wield sovereign immunity as a sword and seize property with impunity, even without a colorable claim of right. 
And he, he goes on to say um, that the tribe has argued that the Lundgrens should negotiate with them over this. But Justice Roberts says, well, you know, to say that they should negotiate once you've said that they have no remedy in court um, doesn't seem like a, like a meaningful um, remedy for them. They have no leverage, no ability to negotiate if the tribe can say, well, if the tribe is free to walk away with no repercussions because they can't go to court. Um, one uh, um, remedy that the government had suggested was to basically force the tribe to take them to court. And if the tribe were to sue the Lundgrens for a quiet title action, they would be, have to waive their sovereign immunity to get into court. So the argument is that they should basically just continue to try and occupy that land to to go onto the land, cut down trees, you know, uh, uh, erect a structure on the land um, to try and force the tribe to take them into court. And Justice Roberts basically says that 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 that. Uh, Here's a quote. He says, such brazen tactics may well have the desired effect of causing the tribe to waive its sovereign immunity, but I'm skeptical that the law requires private individuals who, again, had no prior dealings with the tribe to pick a fight in order to vindicate their in interests. So he goes on to discuss this immovable property exception and says that basically if this immovable property exception doesn't apply, if the lower courts find that this doesn't apply in this situation, that the court may need to revisit this tribal sovereign immunity issue in the future um, because he, he just seems very uncomfortable with the idea that there would be no viable remedy here. And that brings us finally, me finally to the dissent um, by Justice Thomas. This is joined by Justice Alito. And he uh, focuses his dissent on this immovable property exception. And he faults the majority for not answering the sovereign immunity question. He says that the court should have ruled on this immovable property rule. He says it was fully briefed. It was argued that the oral argument, the court um, should have decided it. And he goes into a, a very um, uh, detailed historical discussion of this immovable property rule. He cites uh, influential legal treatises that go all the way back to the 14th century and basically says it's an ancient principle that land is governed by the law of the place where it's situated and says that there's essentially an unbroken tradition that's been uniformly accepted in United States and international law and cites various um, precedents uh, saying, for example, that Indian tribes possess only the common law immunity from suit traditionally enjoyed by sovereign powers. So saying that they wouldn't have something greater than that and saying, um, tribal sovereign immunity, citing cases where the Supreme Court had held that tribal sovereign immunity should not be broader than the protection offered by state or federal sovereign immunity. Um, and uh, and basically just arguing that, that, that given this long-standing immovable property rule, there's no reason um, that the court uh, should find anything different for these tribal sovereigns and should have decided that rather than sending it down to the lower, the, the lower cases. Um, so, so that's that case. So again, it didn't, didn't really decide a whole, whole lot since it just sent it back down to the lower case. So it ended up being kind of a nothing, but it's interesting to see this dispute between the justices about how the court should have handled this case. And also the interesting, um, attitude of Chief Justice Roberts, who clearly seems very bothered by, um, the lack of a remedy, but you know, on, on the other hand, a lack of a re remedy kind of, uh, it's part and parcel of what it means to have sovereign immunity. Sometimes that's the effect of sovereign immunity is that people are unable to get a remedy in court. So, um, it's, uh, interesting. That brings us to the end of this live stream episode. Our next live stream will be a week from today. That's Thursday, May 31st at 9 PM Eastern time. That's our usual weekly live stream time, Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can always check the Counting to Five YouTube channel to find the next scheduled live stream. In next week's live stream, so the court earlier today had its uh, regular uh, private conference to um, to uh, uh, decide on uh, various cert petitions and, and other business. Now, due to the Medor Memorial Day holiday, orders the orders list that would normally come down Monday morning will be issued Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. And according to the court's public information office, opinions are expected Tuesday morning, and these would be issued at 10 a.m. So um, we should be getting more opinions, and we may or may not get some more granted cases. So that's what I intend to cover next week. And just as a reminder, there's only five weeks left before the end of the term, and there's 32 cases left to be decided. So a lot of cases that should be coming down in the next few weeks. Um, this case has had a lot of uh, kind of a, a unusual number of major cases, highly anticipated cases that are really being closely watched. Of those highly of the cases that I would put in that category, there's really only two that have already been decided. That's last week's Murphy v. NCAA. That's the sports betting case. Um, that I talked about in the last week, and then today's Epic Systems case about the employee arbitration uh, class waiver. Um, provisions. 
but the rest of the major cases are still pending. There's the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. That's the clash between anti-discrimination law and uh, con uh, right against compelled speech. There's the Carpenter, U.S. v. Carpenter case about um, the standard for the government to obtain cell, cell phone, uh, cell tower location data. Uh, there's the two cases the court has, Gil v. Whitford and Benesek v. Limon, the two cases about partisan gerrymandering, gerrymandering to afford a, a major advantage to one political party. There's Nifla v. Becerra, that's the uh, a case about um, California, the California FACT Act, which requires certain disclosures by uh, crisis pregnancy centers. Janice v. Asks Me, um, which is a case about the legality of um, uh, uh, unions requiring non-union members to pay fees to cover uh, collective bargaining and other uh, uh, expenses. South Dakota v. Wayfair, that's the case about um, uh, whether states can uh, impose a state sales tax on out-of-state uh, internet vendors. And uh, last but certainly not least, Trump v. Hawaii, the litigation over the travel ban, the uh, the um, the ban on uh, entry into the country by uh, nationals of, of certain countries. Um, so those are the, the major cases that are still out there and are all going to come down in the next five weeks. Um, and from here on out, every Thursday, the court has its private conference. Orders come down every Monday, Tuesday next week is the holiday, but every Monday other than that, the court will almost certainly add additional opinion days later in the term just to spread out the opinions because they will have so many opinions coming down those last few weeks. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we we'll be looking at for the next five weeks. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio podcast, I'd love your feedback. You can leave comments on the show notes at counting to five.com on the counting to five YouTube channel or Facebook page. You can tweet at counting to five or send an email to Mike at counting to five.com. Please subscribe to the counting to five YouTube channel or audio podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. And thank you for listening. This has been counting to five.